Our next speaker. Any. Our next speaker is uh, David Stenner, uh, who has just last week uh, obtained his PhD. Again, <laughs> in North African history uh, from UC Davis. And uh, the topic of his uh, dissertation is, and I'm working now with the uh, actually fine handwriting uh, that the Moroccan and uh, Nationalist Movement Global Campaign Against Colonialism, 1930 to 58. Uh, and he will begin, uh, this is a wonderful, a Sultan Visiting Scholar, uh, so he will be a uh, Sultan Visiting Scholar in, uh, at UC Berkeley next month. So from a presentation directly to a Sultan. And today he's going to speak on the following topic. Looking towards the future, Morocco's Arab language press, the Holocaust, and, and post European memory after 45. Alright, well, thank you uh, to organizers for inviting me. It's a great thrill. And so when I got Samir's email a few months ago and he told me about the workshop and he said, David, uh, start working on something related to this so you can come. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, that's great, because I was just finishing my dissertation, which, as just mentioned, was the Moroccan Nationalist Movement. And I worked neither on Jewish history, nor on the Holocaust, nor on the Second World War, nor on memory studies or anything. So I thought that's a great opportunity to do something different for a change. And so I just began about eight weeks ago to do research for this paper that hopefully most of you have read. And so I'll just give a summary. I have to do some readings because there are a lot of quotes, but I try to not repeat everything I, I said or to not put you to sleep at such a, uh, such a late hour in the day. And uh, let us really briefly begin by looking at the, uh, the Moroccan uh, press during the Protectorate. So following the emergence of anti-colonial protests in Morocco in 1930, um, various Moroccans began to publish their own newspapers outside the control of the French, you know, French colon-controlled mass media. These newspapers were often in French, sometimes in Arabic, they usually appeared once a week to once a month, and most of them lasted only a year, two years, maybe three years, because of poor financial reasons. But it was the beginning of the media, of the native-controlled, modern-style uh, press in the country. And then, uh, after the second, after the uh, during the Second World War, there was still some press activity, but it really re-emerged after the landing of the Allied forces in November 42, and then after the publication of the Independence Manifesto in January 1944, and the founding of Hespal Istiqbal, the Independence Party, which was by far the most important uh, political uh, anti-colonial organization within the broader nationalist movement. And the Istiqbal almost immediately began to publish Oh, actually, we had a nice congress where they met. Um, and al Istiqlal began to publish various newspapers. First of all, Al Alam, which is the newspaper I analyzed for this paper, that began in September, I think, 1946, and it was a daily newspaper. But they also published in French. And those two newspapers, um, I have them, <coughs> and eventually, if I decide to continue this project, I will all also analyze them. I think it will be interesting to contrast there. French language and Arabic language publications, but I haven't done that yet. <coughs> so first it was L'Opinion du Peuple. So that was from March 47 until June 48. They seized that and then they began again in uh, 51 with a newspaper called Al Istiqlal, uh, which lasted until December 1952. And after the anti-colonial protests and riots in Casablanca in December 1952, all nationalist parties were banned by the protected authorities and all newspapers were banned as well, which is the reason why all these publications ceased in 52 and they re-emerged right before the end of the protectorate in, I think, late 1955. Um, and with regard to Al Alam, very briefly, the average issue consists of four pages during the pre-52 period. And 
interestingly enough, I'm going to go into more detail, it's usually the first page which contains one or two photos that has news that cover world events. And the last page is actually the one, I don't know if they're in the right order to be honest, I think the third one is actually the last page, is the one that covers specific Moroccan events. And in between they're usually more longer essays, analysis, etc. And they always had to specific sections, so an entire page dedicated to specific topics such as agriculture and economics, the sports track, because they were really into sports, and the women's garden, advice for the modern Islamic uh, nationalist minded woman, etc, etc. And uh, most interestingly for the purpose of the study are the regular op-ed pieces written by the regular contributors, most importantly uh, the nationalist Abdel Kabir Al-Fasi was situated in Tanja, uh, Abdullah Ibrahim in Paris, Abdel Karim uh, Ghalab, and Abdel Majid Ben Jadoun, who were in Cairo. And those, as I'll continue, were the ones that caught my attention the most. So, during the post war years, Al Alam dealt mainly uh, dealt with the Second World War on an irregular basis, and a few topics received coverage. The first one, and one of the first issues ever issued by Al Alam, was on the Nuremberg trials. Um, the death sentences, and it talked a little bit about the, the, the crimes committed. It talked about the Nazis, but it never really said what exactly the Nuremberg trials actually were about. It was pretty clear they'd done something pretty bad, that they deserved death, but it wasn't quite clear what exactly they had done. The newspaper also published other short notes on unearthed facts concerning the war, such as newly discovered Nazi documents published by the State Department, the fate of German POWs in Soviet captivity, or the suicides of former German generals. Then it had a series of reports called Secrets of the War that were some, were some semi-sensationalist in dealing with various facts of the war, such as British officers that served in the Nazi army, um, or obscure spies that changed the course of history. So that was the, the largest uh, aspect of World War coverage. Unsurprisingly, the Holocaust specifically received even less coverage than the war in general. And when it happened, it usually did so within the context uh, of the conflict over Palestine. Now, most articles I'm talking about today were written by the Moroccans, but quite a few articles in there were just taken from news agencies or the Arab press, for example, from Egypt, etc. And one article from the Egyptian al balagh refuted Zionist claims of an ongoing oppression of Jews in Europe, concluding that, quote, the relations between Russians and Jews are good and solid. We do not hear of oppression in England and France, and we have never heard that Sweden, Norway, and Switzerland attempted to oppress a race. Arguing in 47 that now was time for the Jews to stop complaining and to go back to the pre-war ways of how things have been in Europe because everybody was suffering and quite frankly there were no anti-Semitic regimes around right now so please don't come to Palestine. That was the basic idea. And another point that the author also mentioned is that whereas the Jews used this, uh, the, the Second World War as a reason to migrate to Palestine, other, quote, other peoples whom Hitler had oppressed in a horrible and even more repulsive manner also didn't make such a big deal out of it. An article written actually by a Moroccan named the Abdel Majid Ben Jaloun from Cairo who was doing propaganda activities on behalf of Moroccan independence at the Arab League at that time wrote that, quote, Hitler helped the Zionists the day he chased the Jews away, killing them in Germany first and then in Europe. Now as a consequence, the Jewish elements that migrated to Palestine due to the persecution of Germany during the war brought terrorism to Palestine and strengthened Zionism, which was an ideology that comes close to Nazism. Finally, he explained that it didn't make any sense that the Palestinians should pay the price for the crimes committed by Germany, since, quote, not the Arabs, but all of mankind is responsible for the persecution of the Jews in Europe. An article written by high-ranking Istiqlali Mohammed Yazidi, who was the first secretary general of the uh, Istiqlal party in the summer of 47, provides further insights. The nationalist who said, quote, that he did not deny the Jews experienced serious catastrophes, and interestingly enough, he used the Arabic word Nakba, 
that was obviously before the Palestinian Nakba, during the past years and were afflicted by cruel calamities, especially in Central Europe, and the Palestinians are first to believe that the Jews are worthy of sympathy and compassion after their hardships. But it did not warrant the current seizure of Arab land since, quote, the Muslims did not assault the Jews with violence in the past centuries, but instead assisted them and offered them hospitality. Now, there are also various articles dealing uh, with uh, the Jews in general without ever mentioning the Holocaust or Nazi Germany. For example, one article refuted the fact that the current Jews at that time were at all related to the ancient Israelites and therefore had any claim over Palestine. And it gave a long history of the Jewish people without ever mentioning uh, the Second World War. And another article explained, that was in the spring of 48, another article explained the intellectual and legal history of the concept of genocide, which was just being adop adopted by the UN, um, which in Arabic they called Katul Ashu'aub, so the killing of peoples. And the author <coughs> saw as the best example for what a genocide is, quote, the chain of crimes committed by the Nazis against the Polish people. And a third article analyzed statistically in a lot of detail the decrease of Jews, the number, you know, uh, the decrease in numbers of Jews across Europe between 39 and 47, uh, without ever mentioning the reason behind the decrease. So it's, it was mentioned, but it really wasn't explained that the Holocaust had happened in those articles. So it became clear that although Al Adam regularly made allusions, not regularly, every now and then made allusions to the Holocaust and to uh, to the Shoah. It, the uninformed reader would not have been able, just by reading the pages of Al Alam, to uh, really gain a sense of what had happened in uh, Europe during the preceding years. Now, two events were very important here. Uh, the UN partition plan for Palestine adopted on November 29, 1947, and the Israeli Declaration of Independence on May 14, 1948, which you can see when you read the newspaper that the sympathy toward the Jews decreases even further following those two dates. So contemporary politics definitely influence uh, the writings and the pages of al Anna. But I argue that we cannot really reduce the depictions of uh, the Holocaust in al Anna merely to uh, the expansion of Zionism and Palestine, because there were other factors linked to, us, uh, linked to uh, this narrative as well. Instead, what I realized when reading this newspaper, instead of just you know, cherry picking the articles that mention Jew or Zionist or whatever in it and reading them, that was only giving me part of the picture. So instead I decided to actually, well not read every article, but to go through it and get an overall picture of what Al Alam dealt with, to situate the depiction of the Holocaust within the larger editorial line of Al Alam, of the newspaper, the main nationalist movement used to, you know disseminate news about the world and indoctrinate nationalism among the Moroccan people. And thereby we gain an insight into the nationalist ideational landscape. What I call a look forward towards the future, hoping to overcome Euro European hegemony to create a new world of equality inspired by the freedom struggles of the peoples of Asia and Africa. Because in this world view, it made little sense to look back at the details of the preceding decades characterized by Western colonial domination and two, West, two world wars that had, after all, been begun in Europe. Instead, the Moroccans viewed the recent events as coherent and logical, and the Holocaust appeared not as a noteworthy aberration, but rather as a consequential outcome of European culture. Now, that's another article on Zionism. Anyway, a good example of the Moroccan nationalist perspective can be found in an article written by Abdel Kabir al fassi the most important journalist, on May 8, 1948, which is the third anniversary of the uh, German unconditional surrender and, of course, the infamous Setif massacre in Algeria. Now, celebrating the ceasefire, that's uh, what al fassi did, that, quote, ended the last war, the author also criticized the beginning Cold War, this quote, period, which we can neither call war nor an age of peace, as a threat to world justice. Also dealing with the Second World War itself, he refused to view Nazi Germany as some sort of aberration of history. Um, quote, we do not say that one of the fortunate results of the war was ending the Nazi tyranny, because 
subjugation and despotism do not characterize solely Nazism and fascism, but are innate to all human beings. Because what is Hitler but a Germanic symbol of tyranny? He asked, the like of which has befallen mankind throughout all times, contrary to all, quote, hypocritical claims by civilized man to the contrary. Furthermore, the Allies promised four freedoms, yet had remained but, quote, ink on paper for most people, despite the good intentions of founding the UN, so you lauded that a little bit, which so far yet had not produced any positive results, though. Another thing that Alfasi criticized was European self-perceptions of cultural superiority. Responding to a French newspaper article that had attacked Mahatma Gandhi for various reasons, he explained, quote, that the European thought had apparently reached a low point in light of the legacies of the last war, and this, that displaying such arrogance towards a non-Westerner of Gandhi's standing might have been understandable before the, quote, has catastrophe sent by destiny, but now seemed bizarre in the light of the hunger pangs tormenting the peoples of Europe. His colleague Relat, based in Cairo, provided an, another gloomy outlook on, quote, the century we live in, which has revealed its bankruptcy and dragged mankind into two wars during one generation. With regard to global affairs, he reminded his readers how the hopes, quote, to bind the tyrants of the world to global peace and justice and truth and freedom after the First World War had failed miserably, and that almost instantly the clouds of war had once again gathered over the skies of Europe. But unlike Al-Fasi, um, by December, this article was written by December 47, he no longer believed in the redeeming abilities of the UN. So obviously this is right in the aftermath of the partition plan. Um, a symbol of the uncertainty of the early Cold War era was the threat posed by, posed by atomic weapons. Unlike most aspects of the recent wars, years the bombing of Hiroshima and the subsequent nuclear arms race between Washington and Moscow received regular coverage. An article published under a pseudonym Abu Ferris at the height of the Berlin crisis in spring 48 emphasized the threat posed by atomic bombs in an age characterized by egoism and dominated by, quote, two dreadful blocks which did not cease fighting since the end of the war. Al-Fasi had previously written about this topic as well, saying, quote, he deemed it difficult to believe that Europe is not at the gates of the next war, which will be even more destructive than its predecessor. And all this time, they quoted European politicians, Western politicians that predicted the outbreak of the Third World War at any moment. Now, amidst this bleak state of world affairs, it were the liberation struggles in faraway places that gave a positive outlook to the Moroccans. And the number one individual that featured in Al-Alam was, of course, Gandhi. And the newspapers often reported about, quote, the man more powerful than a nuclear bomb. Other reasons for his popularity, of course, were his opposition to Zionism, as well as his use of fasting as a weapon, which really appealed to the readers, I assume, at the height of Ramadan. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, Gandhi's assassination on January 30, 30th, 48, led to a wave of articles on his life, including a portrait on the front page, um, and moving poems commemorating the catastrophe of his murder. And in the moving obituary, Abdel Kabir, -Kabir al-Fasi lauded him as a hero, quote, that struggled, along the big, uh, along, that struggled alone against the biggest nation known in the history of colonialism, and who will remain in the hearts of all members of oppressed nations who struggle for the liberation of their countries. Now, another independent struggle that received a lot of coverage, I mean, many did, but two biggest ones were the Indian and then the Indonesian ones. Especially the military efforts of the nationalists featured in the pages of Al-Alam, which contained numerous articles on, quote, the steadfastness of the Indonesian people in defending their republic, as well as details on how the Dutch, quote, torture those that fall into their hands, they also mentioned how various former German officers were now fighting in the Dutch colonial army in, the, in Dutch uh, Indonesia and were committing various war crimes there by drawing some sort of uh, direct link between Nazism and Western colonialism. But they also drew, they also uh, argued, uh, the editorial page of Adam also argued that um, they drew the connections between the independent struggle in Indonesia and anti-colonial conflicts in the Middle East, concluding that, quote, the Orient has risen up, 
ready to restore past might and future glory, not only for the Arab nations, but the entire East. In the words of the Moroccan nationalist Abdel Karim Ben Thabit, the Indonesian people wanted freedom and obtained it. So, so I argue that such accounts of anti-colonial activism provided hope and inspiration and thus stood in sharp contrast to the never-ending stream of disconsolate news arriving from war-depleted Europe. Now let me conclude. Seen within this ideational landscape, the memory of the Holocaust and the pages of Al-Alam assumes a different meaning. Rather than viewing the scant coverage merely in light of contemporary events in Palestine or, and that would of course be even worse, as an expression of some sort of primordial Muslim anti-Semitism, one should analyze it from the standpoint of the Moroccans themselves, constituting in their view but one link in a long chain of European crimes and a symbol of a decaying civilization, it did not seem worthy of too much attention. An additional factor contributing to the outlook of Al Alam's editors were contemporary global events such as the beginning of the Cold War uh, and specifically the struggle over Berlin that occurred at that time. Moreover, the impending possibility of nuclear warfare made the recent war seem like a precursor for an even more devastating conflict rather than a terrible event in and for itself. The Moroccan's colonial memory of the Holocaust has inadvertently diverged from a European memory of the same event, viewing it as a provincial incident on the margins of global history. Thank you. Wow. Okay, there are a lot of things to discuss in this paper. Thanks a lot. Um, go ahead. What's the first one? <clears throat> well, just, uh, I was uh, just one more remark, uh, and uh, 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 perhaps others would pick up on this. Uh, is uh, this kind of upends the notion of center and periphery uh, uh, here in the account here? Uh, it makes an implicit claim that Morocco wouldn't see itself as a periphery in this instance, but rather as a center from uh, the whole. Uh, uh, conception of the world emanates uh, based on its uh, its own situation as a colonial dependency the, the, the sequel the emergence so uh, is this relevant to our uh, our discussion here uh, to what extent uh, uh, can we use this kind of information to reformulate the notion of center and periphery that was that Dan uh, expressed uh, in his opening speech uh, uh, are these countries that uh, fall under the rubric of uh, the, the southern Mediterranean with Palestine in the center and stretching across the Far East? Are they a periphery or are they a center? Uh, 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 and is that really, is that a good question to ask? Should I say something? Or maybe you can start with this one because I think it will spark some. <laughs> So that was exactly what my thought was, right? So first I, I asked the question, how do Moroccans view the Holocaust? That was, after all, what somebody had asked me to do. And so I read that, and like I mentioned during the talk, I found that unsatis unsatisfying to ask you know, this Eurocentric question towards the Moroccans, like, we have this event, what do you say to it? Yes. And then, you know, you can get something out of it, but I feel like it, it, it doesn't really capture how the Moroccans do it. Instead, ask, why would the Moroccans even care? Like, wh what is their rather larger understanding? And so this is why if you put Morocco at the center of this question, then yes, exactly, I view, you know, you s some f I, on my PowerPoint, the fancy title, provincializing the Holocaust, right? So th this kind of idea that it's we've seen from Morocco, it's suddenly, you know, there are various reasons, right? It has to do with Palestine, I don't deny that, but the overall lan the ideational landscape that, you know, Europe, while important, and while the Istiqlal was very bourgeois and, you know, not anti-Western actually, Overall, there was a, you know, disenchantment with what Europe was, and you know, how can they claim? You know, why should we give that much attention to them if all the hope and the positive, the positive news, they all come from non-Western country? And so, if you look from from this Moroccan angle, and suddenly much more interesting were other events, and then the Holocaust, that right? the war in general just was not as central. This is a great project, David. I think. One of the questions I have, if you look at this period, yeah. and if you take newspapers as a source to figure out what kind of discourses Moroccans, both Jews and non-Jews, were having about the Holocaust, I think you have to expand 
the source was limited. And instead of focusing only on the Istiqlal party, there is a lot, you have to look at all the other newspapers coming out from the Lord. Because you will, you, what you will find is that you will find different conversations and different tones and in the way people are discussing these issues. And also, Jewish newspapers themselves do. So, so, so I think it will be interesting to figure out if you can focus on a decade or a particular time, and then from there you could look at what kind of discourse or what kind of conversations that were taking place at the public sphere. For, and then, you, so theoretically, if you use Weber's organization of discourse, then I think it will give us an idea about how these types of discourses and how these types of um, statements about the Holocaust and how Muslims and Jews start to think about the Holocaust start to get into public discourse and public debate. So that's just a some way I see it. Because otherwise, if you focus only on one newspaper, I think it's important. The Istiqlal Party is definitely central. But um, when you read Hat Hatimi's work, Hatimi's work, as, as great as it is, as important as it is, it really doesn't give us the big picture. Because it focuses only on the Istiqlal Party. And he answers some of these questions in this really well documented uh, uh, dissertation. But it's, I'm really looking forward. To your German, your German way of how you <laughs> <laughs> on, the, on the detail. I think it's, I blame uh, I blame Susan for this. So. <laughs> so this is of course one of the comments we always love to hear that you need to look at more sources. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, Thank you for the presentation. It's very interesting. I think that one of the most important thing is that the. The nationalists try to use the other nationalist struggles, not in, in North Africa, to give them the impression that they are not uh, talking about their uh, national struggle in Morocco, but about other uh, national struggles. I think it was something like uh, the tactics of the national movements in Morocco. I think I know the case in Tunisia, it was uh, the same. Is the same. They are not talking about what's happening in Morocco, in Tunisia at that time, even not in Algeria. They are talking about other uh, national combats, uh, national struggle, just not to, to talk about the situations in uh, Morocco because it was a very sensitive period during the, the, the post war. Uh, in Morocco, in Europe, was a very sensitive for the French. They don't, didn't know at that time what they are going to do in the, their uh, colonies. So, uh, for them, it was very sensitive. Uh, I have a question and another remark first. Uh, you should regard, the, the, I think they also regard the, 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 the issue of the Jews in the national struggle as a very marginal uh, subject. It was not very important for them whether the Jews would think, what they would think about the, the national struggle in Morocco, in Tunisia. Sometimes they ask the Jews what would be your uh, positions regarding tell, uh, this and this uh, questions. But it was, it was not the main uh, object of the national struggle. The question of the Jews will be solved after, we don't know how, but it will be solved perhaps after the French will leave the country. And then only also a question, did you find articles regarding uh, Zionist activities in Morocco? Not Zionist activities as a general uh, uh, issue, but uh, how the Zionist movement in Morocco acts in Morocco. I wonder about all the post-colonial literature, not just concerning Morocco. It, it seems that the whole idea of the Holocaust is marginalized, and maybe we can ask um, a question about what, how post-colonial thinking, uh, why post-colonial thinking was delayed its occupation with the Holocaust and, and, the, and, and especially with the question of Jews, because it seems that it's not just in Morocco, not just Moroccan nationalists. And, all over, and, and even not in the Muslim world, but other places, when, when we read the, the, the classical literature of, of, of the both um, thinker and activist, it seems that the, if, for me it will be natural to expect them to, to, to relate to the Holocaust 
as a reference, but, but it's not the case. And I just wonder, maybe it's a question for you know, maybe other people, why, why so? Do you, do you mean post-colonial, you know, literally, like, or post-colonial? Both, thing? both. Oh, okay, both. yeah. Both yeah, yeah I was wondering because I... Yes, yes. <coughs> sorry, just, mm. Is there a, a question? So thank you again for this presentation. I really enjoyed this book, yes. Um, and I, was, I have two perhaps related questions. Um, one of them is about a lot of this reflection on itself as a newspaper, or does it have any articles reflecting its origin story or a sense? Like, is it just reporting about global events, or is there some sort of narrativization happening simultaneously at the Stiglau's own interaction in these world events, um, such as the Second World War or other things like that? And related to that, um, you mentioned the Soviet reference really quickly, which of course begs the kind of selfish question about communism and the treatment of communism in these pages, right? If you're talking about this imminent next war, nuclear fears, communism seems like we're also make um, an appearance in this context, as well as other nationalist parties. I have one. I have also one question. Okay. It's you know it's almost deep. Um, well, you touched a lot, uh, touched upon a lot of issues there, and I think uh, this is could this could be the beginning of a very big project. And I just want to give you some hints about how big it is <laughs> before you start going to other newspapers, and which you you decide on what is your focus, but. Some of the things you spoke about, like the, speaking about the similarities between Zionism and uh, Nazism, is of course not a topic invented in Morocco at the time. It's something that is a big issue already in the 1920s in Germany and outside of Germany. It's a well-known topic, so you need to go back and see where does it come from, who speaks about it. Maybe those Moroccan Jews, for example, who are not interested in Zionism, just like in Germany, they emphasize similarity between these two movements for their own reasons and also for some uh, real, uh, there are some similarities if you want to look at them from this perspective. Of course, the second point is, of course, the Holocaust does not exist as an event or a name yet. So to assume why Morocco one does not speak about it is, first of all, to look around if someone speaks about it as the Holocaust outside of Israel. You refer to the Nuremberg trials, the Holocaust does not appear in the Nuremberg trials. So when you speak about the Nuremberg trial in Morocco, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be surprised that they do not speak about the Holocaust, because the trial themselves, and you have uh, Donald uh, Bloxham's book about the Nuremberg trials, that really refers to this question of what is presented and what is not, and how the trials actually influence the not speaking about the Holocaust after these days. One more thing, uh, another topic, really you have a lot there, of course, India and Gandhi and all of these issues are, again, a question of how does one refer to Gandhi during the war and why, in other post-colonial contexts, uh, but also the question of the age of egoism, which is really one of my favorite ones, because it's a tremendously important topic all over Europe in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, a lot of church people, for example, speak about how this age is an age of crisis, and they speak about the age of egoism all the time. So all of these issues are actually kind of old topics that people refer to in the post immediate post-war era. And it's very interesting, where do they come from? Uh, and beyond that, of course, what also Alma referred to is the question of the specific uh, medium and genre of this newspaper. What do we write in newspaper and how much do newspapers actually, specific newspapers actually tell us about what is interesting for people in Morocco? Because sometimes it's just anecdotes. Maybe we shouldn't look so so deep for our meanings. Oh, great. Now I have I can spend can, can I just add one little yeah. piece to that? Yeah. Which is just to ask a little bit more about readers and the yeah. community of readers. Who's reading this and, and how does that impact our okay. presentation? Well, let's start with that. So it had a, a circulation of about 7,000 issues daily. And the readership was, uh, by and large, the urban bourgeoisie that A could read, B was interested in, in, in political events, <coughs> and C could afford a subscription to Alara. And then, of course, it was wide, disseminated much wider because it was read in public places. It was, you know, one issue wasn't read by one person, but by many, many persons. And you know, like the ideas of the coffee house in 18th, 19th century Vienna or whatever, 
that you know people read it out loud and shared these ideas. So it's not only seven thousand, but I would argue that it's this the insight. What in, uh, is that? This is what Istic language was led by bourgeois elite, urban elite wanted its readership, which was also by and large urban bourgeoisie, and only by about the 50s you see them beginning specific sections on workers, workers' rights, workers' activism, but they consciously target workers as, as a readership. Doesn't mean they didn't exist before, but you see the shift only a little bit later on. And uh, you know, I have issues until 50, December 52 when it was banned, but uh, I do read Arabic, and I read it well, I think, but it takes a lot of time to go through it. So I, I, like, September 48, I just didn't have any time anymore before coming here. So that's why I just randomly stopped there. Um, they, from there, we can go on uh, expanding it to other sources. So about half the questions I got here, I anticipated, which is a good thing, because apparently that's, I thought about that, some of it myself. And that is, so if I really do this, if I already invest two months of hard work in it, I feel I should do more with it. I can't just abandon it after talking about it for 20 minutes. But in order to be a substantive, like some article that I would be proud of to have my name signed under, I have to at least read the French language publications. I have to finish at least until 52. And then I have to find a legitimate reason why to stop in 52, not even continue after that. And in a, a preferably, I would also at least look at the publications of one or two more nationalist parties. But that is a lot of work. I have to see like, like cost-benefit ratio, like what I'm going to do with it, and is that something I want to do? But I fully agree with all these comments. And I would also, um, you know, if you've read the paper, I have some quotes here, and they have a little bit of secondary literature, but you know, I've never read a book on the on the Nuremberg tribes, for example, which is why I'm so happy to make these comments. And I would have to do a lot of secondary source uh, readings in addition to that. So while all of that is correct, and it is uh, in a perfect uh, world, I would definitely do that. I have to just decide what, is, what I want to do in the next year or two. David, don't worry, we are going to tell you what to do. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> and then I start working on that. 1956, at least. Nine, okay, that's good, because I can skip from December 52. Gratefully, they, they, they banned the newspapers. I don't have to read from 52 until 55. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. 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 The Holocaust isn't even that big a topic anywhere in the world, and now I just look at this specific period. Why did I do that? Well, it's because I had the issues of that newspaper going on until that time, and I work on nationalism, so that's my my period. But in order to justify an article and its relevance and saying this is actually worth being published somewhere, obviously it has to be a little bit more substantial than saying I happen to have found these newspapers uh, somewhere <coughs> in the archives. So I'm aware of that, but I have to uh, take that to, to, to a higher level. Um, Appreciate your high standards. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can achieve that yet. So I'm very. Uh, <laughs> it's a problem. I invested so much ca like intellectual capital that I have to follow through or abandon my investment. Um, so it's interesting that the Moroccans. I'm just going to go through a few points. So one of the points was that the Moroccans uh, talked about a lot of internationalist, anti-colonial anti struggles around the world rather than at home. And yes, one of the reasons was censorship. They were pretty intensely censored, so it was really random. It could be that the headline missed, it could be that a paragraph was gone, it could be just a photo was taken out, or that a whole issue was gone. So they were censored, and therefore they couldn't talk so much about political activism at home, and that is a major reason why they looked abroad. But at the same time, and that's what I wrote about my dissertation, um, is that the American nationalism, the American nationalist movement actually conducted a global anti-colonial propaganda campaign. They had office, official offices in New York, Washington, Paris, Cairo, convince world leaders to lobby, you know, to create public pressure on France to relinquish its protectorate. And almost all the leaders of the nationalist movement spent at least as much time abroad as in Morocco between 44 and 56. So the Moroccan nationalist movement, they weren't just all chilling at home and looking at what was going on in the world. Most of these people were actively abroad for many, many years, engaging with nationalist activists in Cairo, in New York, in Paris, so the international outlook was more than just in this newspaper, it was really like in the DNA of the nationalist movement. With regard to, um, I'm just going to cherry pick a few that I feel like answering. Um, so Alan's reflections upon itself, so there are a few articles that starts after a little while, and um, they have things like, it's not really like, you know, the, the, the what is it called? the Reader's Advocate in the New York Times that every Sunday or Saturday writes on behalf of the readers against everybody in the New York Times. So they had not something like this, but they always, they had these little like random 
sections where they said, to the reader, or the reader and his connection to Al Alam, and then they talked about you know what Al Alam wants to achieve and how the readers react to that. And I didn't study that in depth. I just noticed that they were there, um, and they did have some articles on the party itself, but it was really, really limited. So if you wanted to know what the Al Alam, what Al Istiklal, the party, did on a daily basis, you would get only the most superficial overview, such as Gandhi is assassinated, one page of statements by the Istiklal party. That would be an event that would be covered. Um, representations of communism, so they were really, like I said, obsessed with, uh, not obsessed, I mean it's not an obsession, they were interested with the most important global events on their time, the Cold War, so they always talked about the US, which, in a quote I think I didn't mention, uh, one of the authors called uh, the new culture, they have a culture like a culture that has never been before, America strives towards the future, Europe strives backwards. So there is always this, the Moroccan nationalists were very pro-American, at least very fascinated by America, which stood in their view in contrast to Europe. And the Soviet Union, most of the articles on the, on the Cold War were really taken from international news agencies. They're pretty neutral on various conferences and what is happening there. But if they had an opinion article, uh, I mean, communism was a clear case, right? I mean, it's atheist, it's anti, it's immoral, it's, I mean, it's everything that is wrong with the Western civilization. So that's a pretty clear judgment, but most mentionings of the Soviet Union were really very neutral newspaper articles. So you had both in the newspaper. Um, that's where a dialogue with another newspaper would be really interesting. Yeah. Like the communist newspapers, of course, would review every single thing about that spent a lot of ink saying that communism is not mutually exclusive with Moroccan national identity or religion and all those sorts of things. So. Yeah, and then the last thing, no, I agree, I agree, I, I, I like talking to people, but I just don't want to be caught up in a second. Sorry. <laughs> Holocaust, I mentioned, and then the last thing I think was the overall, somebody mentioned overall the attitude towards Jews or Zionism in general, and so uh, here, like I said, it was very negative, it was, you know, the readership representing what has happened in Palestine, of course it's negative or very negative. The nationalist movement itself and its er internal letters, when, you know, when they planned their activism abroad, you know, they're going to appeal at the UN, they're going to appeal in Paris. While the Zionists and Jews were not their number one thing on their agenda, they were always aware of it. So in 47, um, the Hizb al-Islah al-Watani, the party of national reform, which is the Istiklal's twin, semi-twin party in the Spanish zone in the north, they sent their first delegate with the corporation of the Istiklal to, the, to New York to participate at the UN General Assembly discussion, and he ran around and hung out with the various diplomats and tried to put Morocco on the agenda. And before he left, Abdel Kharad Torres, the leader of the nationalists in the north, he wrote a letter and saying, you know what, we need to get you a letter of introduction from the Jews in Tetuan, so you can give it to the Jews in America, because they're really, really influential, and we don't have to have the Zionists be on our side, but if they have the Jews against us, it's not going to happen in, in New York. So they wrote him, they, they, I don't know if it actually happened, but at least they tried to get the local Jewish community to write him an introductory letter to the Jews of New York. And another thing is, and then in 52, as they actually had opened the Moroccan Office of Documentation, Moroccan Office of Information Documentation in Manhattan, they really printed newsletters, they enacted with diplomats, held, you know, press conferences. Um, there they also realized we have to step it up, and so they went to the American uh, Jewish Congress, I think, and they talked to them um, about getting some sort of public backing from them, but the American Jewish AGC, I think, right? American Jewish Committee, right? American, 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 American Jewish Committee. And they made demands, so they I have the back and forth. So they said, yeah, we'll support you if you make a statement saying you will protect the rights of Jews in post-independence Morocco. The American Jewish Committee was yeah. so pro-Zionist. Yeah. Okay. But it was like very obsessed with the uh, with the Jews in Morocco yes, and their status. Yes, for sure. But it wasn't it wasn't okay. a necessarily pro-Zionist organization. I mean, they were very ambivalent on, okay. on immigration. And, and so and some of the others may know know more about this than I do. But my impression is that they were not. Is this correct? I mean, they were not particularly pro-Zionist. They, 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 yeah, it's correct. They started to yeah. change, but I mean, compared to the like, yeah. pro-Jewish Congress. Yeah, they were not. And and so uh, so they had there they had. Uh, um, um, so they had a back and forth negotiating the public statement by the Istiklal in New York, and once they approved it, the Istiklal read it, and the AJC said, "All right, you know, we 
give a blessing to the independent struggle of Morocco. And there are various other interactions with Jewish groups, like when Benuna went in 47, the Arab office, which was a lobby group for Palestine in New York, they offered him a, a space, like an office space inside their larger office, because he was working from his hotel room. And he said, you know, in his diary, he wrote, um, I rejected um, this great offer, because if I do this, all the Zionists are going to be my case, and that's really not what I want right now. And three months later, the FBI closed down the Arab office after, you know, the New York Times, various politicians had complained that this was an anti-Zionist lobbying organization. So it was a very smart move for the sake of uh, the Moroccan independence front. All right. Uh, thanks. We have to stop here. Uh, since we've been so wonderful in more or less, you know, getting back the time we were lost, we're getting a prize. The prize is food, and it's waiting for us outside. Please, please be back here. In 15 minutes. How much? 15 minutes. Well, you're much nicer. I wanted to say 10 minutes. <laughs>